Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. So for today's true crime story, uh, we're actually headed to Sao Paulo, Brazil um, to talk about a guy named Florisavo de Oliveiro. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I am sorry to anybody watching that cringed at that pronunciation. <laughs> um, so he was a vigilante, serial killer, and former police officer. Um, or an officer of the military police in the state of Sao Paulo. Um, which I believe are very similar to, I guess, in the states what we would consider police officers. Um, and he is accused of 50 plus murders in the outskirts and suburbs of Sao Paulo throughout the 1980s. And in some ways, he's actually considered um, one of the more controversial characters in the police chronicle. Um, and he's one of those killers that kind of as soon as they're caught, they'll admit what they've done, but then later, once they kind of realize, oh my god, I just admitted this, they're gonna deny it every time. Uh, he was one of those guys. And he was thought to have been a vigilante, um, and but some people that were around uh, during that time uh, suggested that some of the people that he killed, he killed them because of how they looked. Um, that it wasn't necessarily like vigilante justice, that it was just, oh, you, you're, you look different than me, so I'm gonna kill you. You didn't necessarily wrong me. And he, he honestly did this in his spare time. Like he was military police by day, and killer by night. It was kind of like the reverse Batman. You know, he's Bruce Wayne by day, vigilante justice by night. Um, only this guy was serial killer by night. And he really kind of focused on the area of, I believe it's pronounced Jabaquara. I could be wrong on that. Um, because during the time that this was all happening and during his time as in military police, there was a lot of insecurity in that area. Um, so he kind of focused there. And the reason he was considered a vigilante of sorts was because traders and marketplace people, marketplace sellers, were his biggest clientele. Um, and so... He could be considered vigilante justice or kind of a hitman of sorts. They're de kind of depending on who you talk to, will they may give you a different kind of title for him. Um, and there's one person that ended up surviving uh, his attack. Uh, this guy's name was... Jose, Jose Aparecido uh, Benedito, I think. Again, I'm from the U.S. I am obviously white. My pronunciation is terrible. Uh, he actually was the confirm, a confirmed survivor. Um, although Olivero said, oh yeah, no, nobody survived. But this guy, he was shot. He acted dead. He acted like he was killed and then managed to escape after Olivero had either left or wasn't paying attention to him anymore. He was able to escape. And one of, one of the journalists that was covering um, Olivero's crimes, uh, Caco Barcelos, I believe, uh kind of made made him notorious and infamous uh for his crimes 
And most shootings that he was charged with, because there were several, multiple shootings, uh, took place in 1982, so the early, early 80s. And it was kind of one of those, all the people that were killed were, were just riddled with bullets. And it essentially caused panic in the area. Um, and some one reason that the police in that area took so long to find him was he was smart enough to change cars. He changed the color, changed the make, the model of vehicles relatively frequently. Um, one that he, a couple that he was very um, known to drive was a Chevy Impala, a Ford Maverick, and a, a Chevette. Those were kind of the big ones that he tended to use during the time of his crimes as a getaway vehicle, as a get to where I want to kill people sort of thing. Um, and he was arrested for the first time on September 22nd of 1983. Um, and was accused of 20 plus murders. And he was actually recognized by several witnesses. Um, but he actually only confessed to one uh, of the 20 that he, 20 plus that he was being charged with. He only admitted to one that had happened in February of 1982 in the slums of uh, Jardim Selma, where uh, he was denounced by a friend of a victim. Um, that's the only murder that he had admitted to. And many, many years later, um, so this would have been during his imprisonment, he did end up admitting to many of the murders, 20 plus murders, but it took several years of imprisonment before that actually happened. Um, and like I said, he was being followed by some journalists during this time, and they had dubbed him uh, Cabo Bruno. And... So in news articles, in other reports, that's how he's commonly referred. Um, and because there were many witnesses to his crimes, the, most people were able to give kind of a general description of him, whether it be, oh, he was about this tall, or he had a mustache, or his eyes were this color, or, you know, whatever. Um... He, there were actually several men that were actually killed, executed by police, because the police thought that these other men were Cabo Bruno, but they hadn't, they didn't realize at the time that it was one of their own guys that was, you know, doing these killings. Um, so then. During that time, there was 12 trials uh, for those different people. And then after the 12 trials, after all those people had been um, executed or were still in prison waiting execution, um, because they had police testimony, they were finally able to figure it out. Alvaro was uh, ultimately sentenced to 113 years. Um, there wasn't a ton of information about his court case. So I'm just, because I couldn't find a ton of details and the details that I could find were conflicting in a lot of different ways. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but he did end up getting 113 years. Um, and he actually tried to escape three different times uh the last time being in may of 1991 and he was detained in the jose augusto caesar salgado penitentiary in tamembe again i am sorry for pronunciations um and while he was there during his stay there he actually converted to uh be an evangelical christian and 
he, during an interview, he said that he preferred being called Bruno. So kind of an homage to the nickname that he was given, Capo Bruno. And then in 2008, um, and he was actually a pastor at this time, uh, he got married to a housewife that did volunteer work at the prison. And then in 2009, uh, Alvaro requested to be sent to a semi-open regime uh, prison. So this would be probably more of the equivalent of like a more, uh, more like a minimum security prison, probably like that's what we would have in the States that would be the most equivalent. Um, and he was, he had to go through a couple interviews with a um, criminological psychosocial uh, person. He had to get evaluated by people like that. And after two, two evaluations, uh, it was granted that he could go to this uh, semi-open regime. So he went from more of like a high-level security prison to a low or lower, much lower level of prison after after a lot of years. Um, and he was, although during you know, while you're in a semi-open regime in Brazil, from my understanding, you can do um, like temporary leave uh, to, uh, I guess, like go to work, visit family, that sort of thing. Um, he was denied that actually for a long time, but it was later granted to start in 2017. But in August of 2012, uh, he was actually granted his freedom after 27 years of imprisonment. Um, and then it was based on a law that Brazil has that if you're in prison for more than 20 years and you have good behavior for most of that time, you can be considered for this release. Um, and he actually said in an interview after he got out that he kept his release license with him and a list of 10 things that he wanted to do before he died. And he had said, you know, when I was trying to escape, I wanted to complete those. I made this in prison. I wanted to get out so I could do these things on this list. And now, and they kept stopping me. The cops and police kept stopping me. Now, nobody can stop me. So he was bound and determined to do this list. Um, just after a month uh, after getting released, so this would have been about September of 2012, he was actually killed um, in the Quadra Coberta neighborhood at, a, at about 11.30 p.m. Uh, he was shot between 18 and 20 times. Um, from reports that I was able to to read, a gr small group of men had come up to him and his family, opened fire, only aiming at him. They were not intending to hit anybody else in the family, just him. And he was pronounced dead at the scene. Um, they, him and his family were returning from a religious service and which is very unfortunate, but considering the crimes that he did, they, police and other people suspected that it could have been in retaliation to all the killing that he did in the 80s and potentially family members of the people that he murdered. Um, and so during his time in prison, during the 27 years that he was in prison, he had, aside from becoming a pastor, he had actually taken up painting and art and was selling them for small commissions. After his death, his family didn't feel comfortable living in that part of Sao Paulo anymore. So they actually sold 
awful lot of his paintings and artwork that remained after he was released and went to restart their life elsewhere. They, the what I read, it did not say where his family relocated to. It just said that they wanted to restart their life away from Sao Paulo. So they very easily could have gone to like Mexico or the States or um, any number of places, but I didn't really want to look into his family because um, they deserve their privacy after considering everything that happened. So if y'all want to look it up, go right ahead. I didn't, I didn't want to, I don't feel comfortable doing that to a criminal's family. I don't want to really know much about them after, unless there's important information that I could find. Um, so if anybody has any questions or anything, or maybe knows a little bit more about, about this guy, feel free to leave it in the comments. And if there's anybody that you'd like me to talk about, feel free to leave it down in the comments as well. Totally willing to look into them. Have a great day, everybody.